My name is Dr. Tamseel Ahmed. I'm an endocrinologist and I'll be talking about ultrasound guided thyroid biopsy. First a question that many people ask is why, why do I need thyroid biopsy? Generally, we as endocrinologists recommend you to undergo thyroid biopsy because a nodule is present in your thyroid gland. That nodule may have been discovered by physical examination, mainly by palpation, or may have been visible on some other sorts of imaging studies such as ultrasound. How is a thyroid biopsy performed? And I will talk to you about how we perform thyroid biopsies in our clinical setup. There are variations that you should know about. We usually do all our thyroid biopsies under ultrasound guidance. There are numbers of reasons for this. Obviously, if nodule is visible best or only on ultrasound, then using ultrasound for guidance makes sense. First, it lets us perform very thorough sampling of many different aspects of the nodule. Second, it's important to target where we want to target and to avoid the structures that we want to avoid, specifically carotid artery and jugular vein, which is which are there next to the thyroid gland and avoiding them is quite easy when using ultrasound for guidance. Uh, first of all, we position the patient on his or her back, the neck extended slightly, the skin is clean, made nice and sterile, use local anesthetics to numb the area and then under, uh, under ultrasound guidance we take samples through the nodule of interest through a very tiny needle that's actually the same that the blood gets drawn with. Well, the size of the needle is again very important. The needle size used for FNAC of the thyroid ranges from 21 gauge to 25 gauge. The larger the needle, the greater the chance of obtaining bloody material and the greater the pain caused by the procedure. If we take a smaller needle, the greater the chance of uh, obtaining dry aspiration. Moreover, Intact cell groups can be gained less frequently with smaller needles. A disposable needle is attached to a disposable 5 to 10 ml syringe placed into a special pistol grip. The only relevant advantage of a larger syringe over the smaller one is in cases of thyroid cyst containing more than 10 ml of fluid. Well, the patient lying in a supine position, the transducer in the left hand of the investigator should be placed transversely over the thyroid so the targeted lesion is seen in the middle of the monitor. Thereafter, the needle is inserted at the midpoint of the transducer and during the puncture, the needle is guided parallel to the transducer. The investigator observes on the monitor when the tip of the needle appears as a small hyperechogenic echo and it's a very nicely done echo which you can see visible on the on your ultrasound machines. After aspiration has been performed, the needle is disconnected from the syringe and the syringe is filled with air. After reconnection of the needle and the syringe, the aspirated material spread onto a glass. During this phase, only a slight pressure is desirable in order to avoid spreading contents material outside the glass. There are four basic forms of staining of thyroid smears. RAPI is the first one by which the histopathologist checks whether the sample is enough or not. Then we have hematoxyl and eosin staining. The main advantage of this is that the histopathologist can more easily accommodate to the staining than to the others. The last two, GEMSA and PAP methods, are the standard methods for thyroid smears. GEMSA is superior to the PAP in the demonstration of cytologic features. However, the only situation where PEP method is clearly superior is the demonstration of the nuclear detail and particularly the presence of nuclear grooving. Patients were fearful of biopsy of any sort or wonder will it hurt. There will be a little bee sting during the procedure, during the local anesthetics, but after that there should be no sensation but a little bit of pressure. After, after that, many folks don't know when the local anesthetists wear off. Others might feel just a little bit of soreness at the biopsy site or a bit of sore throat like they are developing a cold. 
but that only lasts for few hours and goes away on its own. But like other procedures, any other procedures, there are recognizable side effects in some cases. Pain. Uh, this is uh, a kind of a discomfort which is uh, mentioned. And serious pain sometimes lasting for only a moment is observed in roughly 1% of the patients. Patients attending follow-up examinations occasionally mention pain lasting for days or even weeks after efficacy of the thyroid. We cannot relate the presence of pain to any disease entity. Hemorrhage. Very infrequently, a subcutaneous uh, hematoma occurs following efficacy of the thyroid. To avoid hematoma, it is essential to press onto the side of the puncture for at least 2 to 10 minutes immediately after FNAC. Puncture of the small veins. This side effect cannot be avoided. It occurs in approximately 2% of the patients. Again, immediate pressure on the side of the puncture is essential to avoid causing unpleasant local hematoma. Puncture of the trachea. This side effect occurs more often when medially situated small thyroid or lesions are aspirated. In our uh, in in earlier practice, this occurred once in about 200 to 300 FNACs. But after the introduction of ultrasound, this side effect no longer occurred. When a trachea is punctured, the patient immediately coughs. There are no other consequences. Naturally, the patient the, the material obtained after such a puncture is not suitable for cyt cytological diagnosis. Ultrasound guided thyroid biopsy is quite an accurate test. We would like to say that it is 100% accurate, but there is no such thing in medicine. There are certainly instances when despite taking several samples of a thyroid nodule, the pathologist cannot come a conclusive diagnosis. Either uh, there is insufficient sample under the microscope or sometimes the region is clouded by red blood cells. Conversely, there are instances when pathologists can make a diagnosis but it ends up being a borderline precancerous condition. And under those circumstances, they might, they might recommend patients undergo surgical removal. Many patients wonder why don't we remove the nodule in the first place? Don't all nodules need to be removed anyway? That's not the case. The vast majority of thyroid nodules turn out to be benign. So removal of those nodules is not necessary. Only making the, that diagnosis or making that certain that it's benign and not cancerous. That's the important part that can be easily accomplished in most instances with an ultrasound guided biopsy. Are there any alternative to ultrasound guided biopsy? There are some imaging studies that can be done. In nuclear medicine scanning, uh, we can go for uh, thyroid radioactive thyroid scanning, which can show the, the, the nodules, whether they are hot or cold or they are the same of the other, th other part of the thyroid gland. Then there are surgical removals that can be accomplished as well. I hope you found this inf informative and I hope it answers some of the questions that may have had about ultrasound guided thyroid biopsy. Thank you.